Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series, Money Matters, how to make your money count for now and forever. In today's lesson, you'll learn from Scripture the disturbing truth about the health and wealth gospel in this message called, Is the Prosperity Gospel the True Gospel? Perhaps you've heard the old saying, close only counts in horseshoes or hand grenades. That's true. I was reading this morning about a retired Air Force pilot, and he was talking about how close doesn't cut it when you're flying a plane. He said, you have to be dead on accurate if you're going to get to the desired destination, if you're going to hit the target. One degree off in aviation makes a huge difference. Now, if you are one degree off in your course, you will miss your target. For every mile you travel, you will miss the target by 92 feet. One degree off, every mile, 92 feet. If you travel 60 miles, one degree off, you'll miss your destination by a mile. If you travel from JFK Airport to LAX, you will miss Los Angeles Airport by 43 miles and find yourself in the Pacific Ocean. One degree makes a big, big difference. One degree matters. Now, the Bible tells us that the devil is sly and crafty. The beast was more, the, the, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, the Scripture says. And the devil is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said whenever he speaks, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And the devil is the deceiver. The Bible tells us in the book of the Revelation, he deceives the whole world. And the, the, the way that the devil lies and the way that he deceives is by changing the course just one degree. He, he, he takes truth and he adds a little bit of error to turn that course just a degree off, just a little bit off. And because of that, people who buy into his truth mixed with error end up miles and miles away from the desired destination. Someone has said, you know, what is worse, a clock that is five hours wrong or a clock that's five minutes wrong? You know, if, if on your watch right now, you look down and it said 415, five hours wrong, you would say, well, that, that can't be right. I mean, I know Jeff preaches long, but it is not 415. Uh, you could catch it just like that, a clock that's five hours wrong, but a clock that's five minutes wrong, you may not know. A clock that's five minutes wrong could cause you to miss a plane or miss a train or miss an important appointment. The devil is a master deceiver, and he wants us to believe a lie, and the way he gets us to do that is by making it sound a lot like the truth. Well, we've been in a series for the last several weeks called Money Matters, how to make your money count for now and forever. And today, I want to speak to you on the subject of the prosperity gospel. Is the prosperity gospel that we see on television here on the radio, uh, see in churches all over America, is that the true gospel, or is that a gospel that's off just a degree or so? Some people say, well, I don't really know what the prosperity gospel is. And so in your notes, I have a definition of the prosperity gospel, and, and most would agree that this is, is kind of the guts of the prosperity gospel. What is the prosperity gospel? This prosperity gospel says that the believers have a right to the blessings of health and wealth, and they can obtain these blessings through positive confessions of faith and the sowing of financial seeds. 
And that's what you see so often on television. That's what you hear so often on the radio. And that's uh, send in your seed of faith and whatever need you have, God is going to meet that need. It is truth that has a mixture of error. So what exactly does the Bible say about that? And, and recognize this. Some people that uh, preach a prosperity gospel, some are kind of light with the prosperity gospel, and others are very heavy with the prosperity gospel. It, it's kind of on a discontinuum. But whether you're light on it or whether you're heavy on it, it's still basically at the core the same message that God has promised health and wealth and we can obtain the blessings, the material blessings through positive confession of faith and the sowing of financial seed. So let's look and see what the Bible has to say about that. As I told you, the Bible talks a lot about money. Jesus talked a lot about money. And the big reason that he talks so much about money is it's very easy for money to become master. And that's why he talks so much about it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'll begin reading in verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain who suppose that godliness, walking with God, and the, the scheme of the gospel is a means of financial gain. That's what he is uh, referring to there. And he says in verse 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment, when it's not the focus. He says in verse 7, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we can take cannot take anything out of it either. And if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction, literally drown them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierce themselves with many a, a pang, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. The prosperity gospel. I want you to Notice with me three insights regarding the prosperity gospel. Is the prosperity gospel dead on or is it one degree off? Is it the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul dealt with this in his day. And that's why he told Timothy about it. And he is telling us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit about this today. Three insights. Insight number one, the prosperity gospel emphasizes health and wealth. It emphasizes physical health and financial material wealth. That's just part of it. That's part of the deal. And it doesn't come without Scripture because there are Scriptures that those who hold to the prosperity gospel that they will say, well, the Bible tells us this. The Bible promises this. As far as health goes, what well, says in Isaiah chapter 53, by his stripes we are healed. They say, well, that means physical healing. Others would say, well, I think that might mean spiritual healing. No, 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 it means physical healing, and so they will make that case. They will say, well, you just look at the ministry of Jesus. How many people did he heal? Obviously, the Lord wants us to be physically healthy. They'll look at the blessings and the riches of those in the Old Testament. Abraham, the father of all who believe, was very, very wealthy with flocks and herds. And they say, well, you know, Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, he had lots of wealth, material wealth and flocks and herds. Job was very wealthy. Solomon, David's son, 
was so very wealthy, probably the wealthiest person who ever lived. And so they say, you know, there is obviously that kind of uh, teaching, that kind of example in Scripture, and, you know, we're, we're children of the king, and, and if I'm a king's kid, how does a king's kid live? A king's kid doesn't walk around in tattered clothes. A king's kid doesn't drive a crummy, crummy car. I mean, we need to live like the king's kid. Well, let me just share several things about this physical health, material wealth mindset. First of all, health and wealth are appealing to the unsaved man. It's very appealing. You preach a gospel that talks about having physical health and material financial wealth, and that is something that a lost person says, hey, I'm interested in that. I'd like to find out more about that. Tell me about that. Tell me how uh, I can have that. Because what's on the mind of a lost guy, a lost girl? What are they thinking about? Money, family, finery, pleasure, vacations, stuff. The Bible says that the eyes of a fool are on the ends of the earth. And if you don't have a relationship with God, you're not thinking about the kingdom to come. You're thinking about the kingdom right now. You're thinking about what is. And so that is on your mind. And a health and wealth gospel, well, that appeals to somebody like that. And if you preach that kind of message, you can draw a big crowd. And doubtless, lots of people have big crowds that are talking about health and wealth. God wants you healthy, and God wants you wealthy. One thing that you have to watch for that the Bible makes very, very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but a natural man, a natural man is an unsaved man. He's just in his Adamic nature. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But if you talk about health and wealth in this world, in this life, Physical health, spiritual, uh, physical health and material wealth, well, a natural man understands that, and that appeals to the natural man because that's what a natural man wants. That's what he thinks about. And so 1 Corinthians 2.14, uh, when it comes to the prosperity gospel, that, that verse doesn't fit because a natural man says, tell me more. Tell me more. I am interested in learning about how God is going to fill up my bank account and how he is going to give me such great health. Now, remember, too, not only are health and wealth appealing to the unsaved, but health and wealth are temptations used by the devil. You say, where in the world does it say that, that the devil uses health and wealth in his temptations? Well, you remember when Jesus was baptized... It says, then the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and then he was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days, and he became hungry, and then the devil came to him. And the devil came with three temptations. The first one, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. It's a temptation for health. You're looking a little peaked there, Jesus. What about if you worked on the flesh here? What about if you took some bread? Command these stones to become bread. That has to do with health. And uh, Jesus didn't buy into that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then the devil uh, took him to the kingdoms, showed him, as it were, the kingdoms of the world in an instant. And he said, all these are mine, and I will give them to you if you will just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall worship God, and him only shall you serve. There's a temptation for health. There's a temptation for wealth. The last temptation Come to, he took him to the pinnacle of the temple, and he said, jump down, Jesus. Do a couple of backflips, because it is written, he will give his angels, angels charge concerning you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Oh, Jesus, you can wow the people if you will just do this, and they'll look at you and say, what a miracle, what a, a, just an amazing kind of guy. Well, surely he can do all this. 
You know, the Bible says that all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And command these stones to become bread is the lust of the flesh. And I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world is the lust of the eyes. And jump down and you won't hurt yourself and you'll, you can do all these backflips and all this stuff. That's the boastful pride of life. That, those are the three bullets that the devil has in his gun. And he came at Jesus tempting him in the area of health and wealth. Very interesting. And lastly, health and wealth, those are not the things that are emphasized in salvation. The Lord did miracles. The Lord healed many people during his ministry. But that wasn't the emphasis where he said, hey, follow me and I will take care of you uh, physically. You know, when they tried to do that in John chapter 6, they saw Jesus as a meal ticket. And that's when he thinned out the crowd. He said, you're following me not because you saw miracles, but because you ate and you were filled, and now you see me as a meal ticket. And he distanced himself. And after he got done with his sermon in John chapter 6, they quit following him. They said, these are difficult statements. Who can, who can accept these? And they, they didn't follow him anymore, so much to the point where Jesus had to say to his own disciples, do you want to leave too? Remember, Peter said, Lord, where are we to go? You have words of eternal life. We may not understand everything you say. We may not understand that sermon in John chapter 6, but we're going to follow you. Now, salvation is not focused and emphasized on health and wealth. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 14? The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. He doesn't understand those things. They're foolishness to him, and he can't understand it because they're spiritually appraised. A natural man hears Luke 9, 23 and says, deny myself, take up my cross. Well, I, I don't want to do that. Who wants to do that? That just seems dumb. I mean, a cross is an instrument of death. You want me to take up a cross? You want me to deny myself? I mean, what does it say at McDonald's? I deserve a break today. Uh, so why would I deny myself? I mean, I can have it my way at Burger King. And uh, so deny myself? No, that doesn't sound right. That's the master's way. If you want to come after him, if you want to be a disciple of his, you got to die to yourself. you got to pick up your cross daily, every day. What is the Christian life? It's every day dying to yourself and following him. And where do you follow Jesus? Well, where did he go? He picked up his cross, and he went to Calvary, and he died. So the health and wealth gospel, it emphasized, the, the prosperity gospel, it emphasizes health and wealth. Now, there's an old saying, you know, we talk about the Luke 9, 23. Oh, nobody wants to really hear that. There's a saying that says, that doesn't play well in Peoria. You know, it, that, that was a, a phrase that was used some years ago, and that meant, you know, if, if it doesn't hit mainstream, then it's probably not very good. If it, do, if it can't play in Peoria, you don't want to play it. Well, Luke 9.23 doesn't play well in Peoria. Health and wealth play well everywhere because people long for that and dream for it and scheme for it because that is what a natural heart, a fallen heart, wants. Second insight, the prosperity gospel, not only does it emphasize health and wealth, but it emphasizes positive confession. Positive confession. Now, what did I tell you? I said this is, this is one degree off. So there's lots of truth mixed in this, but one degree off can cause you to land in the ocean. Positive confession. Well, is there not positive confession in the Bible? Did Jesus not say in John 14, verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. I want you to think about that for a minute. Is the Lord Jesus really saying that you and I can ask anything that we want, and he's going to do it? Is he locking himself into that kind of a situation? I don't think so. I think what John 14, verse 
23 or 14 verse 13 has to be understood in this light. Whatever you ask in my name, whatever you ask according to me, according to my will and according to my ways, because God is not going to do things that are not according to his will and according to his ways. God doesn't just do whatever you say. We all remember the story of Aladdin and how Aladdin found a lamp. And as he began to shine up that lamp and rub on that lamp, all of a sudden, boom, out comes a genie. And the genie comes and says to Aladdin, yes, master, I will grant you three wishes, whatever you want. Yes, master. And the genie calls Aladdin master, and Aladdin is his master for those three wishes. The Lord is not your genie in a bottle. He's not your genie in the lamp. He's God. He's God. He is the master. He doesn't come to any of us and say, you just tell me what you want because I'm your heavenly bellhop. I'm your flunky, your lackey that just does what you say do. Whatever you ask in my name, it doesn't have anything to do with, with my will. Just whatever you ask in my name that I'm going to do it. Well, that's not biblical, and that's not true, and that's not right. The Lord's not your heavenly genie, and the Lord doesn't do our will. We do his will. It's not about our will. It's about his will. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the cup was coming to him and he was praying and he was sweating drops of blood because the pressure as the weight of the world was crushing down upon him. He cried out to his father, and he said, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. Jesus taught us to pray the Model prayer, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will be done, not your will be done, not my will be done. His will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to remember that it's about his will. And when you pray, there is confidence in prayer. And 1 John chapter 5, I think, clears up any confusion about John chapter 14, verse 13, and it says this, and this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. It's according to his will. Ask anything in my name according to my will, and that will I do. Now, we hear people say, well, you know, what, what do you want? What do you want? What, what dream is in your heart? What desire is in your heart? What, what would you like to have? Name it and claim it. Name it and claim it, because it says that you can name it, whatever you ask in my name. Some have said, well, you know, that theology is name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, confess it, possess it. It's all kind of lumped in there together. It is rhyming words. Now, is that true? Can I name it and claim it? No. Can't name it and claim it. One in, in the prosperity gospel movement said, you can command your mourning. Well, how do I do that? I, God didn't give me the authority to command my mourning. You know, the Lord came to Job when Job began asking God, hey, God, what's up with all this stuff? My life has fallen apart. I don't understand it. And God didn't speak to Job chapter, chapter, after chapter, after chapter, and Job was getting insight from his friends, which was wrong insight. And finally, the Lord speaks to Job in Job chapter 38. And the, the Lord begins to ask Job lots of questions. Hey, Job, how do I do this? How do I make the sun come up, Job? How do I do this and that and the other? Gird up your loins if you're a man. Hey, you think you can talk to me uh, on a level plane? You think you're in my league? And Job heard from God for several chapters, and he said, I repent in dust and ashes. 
I heard of thee with the ear, but now my eye sees thee, and I repent in dust and ashes. Who am I that I should ask God? You know, the Scripture says in Romans, what are you, does the pot talk to the, the, the clay, talk to the potter and say, you can't, can't make me this way? Well, the Lord can do whatever he wants. He's the sovereign king, the king of kings and lord of lords who dwells in unapproachable light. So we don't tell God what to do, and there's no such thing about name it and claim it. Let me tell you what there is. Real faith is not name it and claim it. Real faith is believing and claiming what God has said. It's not name it and claim it. God has to, claim, has to name it in order for you and for me to claim it. And that's, the, that's the, uh, the confusion. That's the one degree off thing. That's the five minutes difference in the clock. It's the Lord wants us to walk by faith. He wants us to take his word and claim the promises that he has in his word. He wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. But he has to name it in order for you and for me to claim it. We don't name it. He names it. And once he names it, then you latch on to it. Say, God, you promised. You promised me in your word. Now, when it comes to this matter of healing, I believe God heals. And when I get sick, I ask God to make me better. And when something happens to somebody in my family, I pray healing. And somebody in our church, Pastor Jeff, will you pray for me? You bet I'll pray for you. And I pray that God would heal them. I don't have any gift of healing. God is the healer. He is Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals. And God sometimes chooses to heal in this life, and sometimes he doesn't. To have a theology where it says that God is always going to heal if you just have enough faith and believe, you know, if that were true, then nobody would die who believed God, right? I mean, because what would kill you unless somebody took your life? But you're not going to die of cancer or uh, Parkinson's or some kind of disease because you just have enough faith. And, and people believe, and they're told in some of these movements, really the, the ones that are very heavy on prosperity gospel, well, the reason you're still in that wheelchair, the reason you're still so sick, the reason you're still so poor is because you don't have faith. And if you just had faith, then you could name it and claim it. I don't know on the physical healing side. Sometimes God chooses to do that. Sometimes he doesn't. That's up to God. You can claim God's goodness. You can claim God's mercy. You can ask him for things. But I think it's very, very hard, unless God gives you a specific word, it's very hard to claim physical healing. But you know what's not hard to claim? And I believe this with all my heart. Emotional healing is yours to claim because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Peace. And so many people, they long for peace. Peace is a gift from God for his children who will walk with him. And you and I can claim those things. Uh, the Bible says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, and thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. And there are times in my life when things are going wrong and I don't have peace and I come before the Lord and I say, Lord, you promised that if I would put my mind on you, that you would give me perfect peace, a peace that surpasses comprehension. So I am claiming what you have already named. You know, the Scripture says in Philippians chapter 4, 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise from God. And if you read the verses surrounding Philippians 4, 19, you'll, you'll find that it comes on the heels of those who are faithful to give to the Lord and honor the Lord from their wealth. And when you're faithful to give to the Lord, the Lord says, I'll meet your needs. The one who honors God, 1 Samuel 2, 30, the one who honors God, he said, him will I honor. And God does do that. But does that mean that, oh, God's going to meet my needs? Yeah, your needs, not your greeds. Well, Lord, I need a car. Okay, I'll give you a car. Well, Lord, you know, I really need a Mercedes. No, you don't. You need a car. Big difference between needing a Mercedes, which you don't, versus needing a car. And so uh, sometimes we can get uh, way out of whack. I heard one guy say, a prosperity uh, preacher, he said, you know, uh, uh, God says, hey, I, I, he said, well, you know, the Lord, when he went into Jerusalem on uh, Palm Sunday, he rode a, a colt that nobody had ever ridden on, so he wants me to have a brand new car. He made that correlation. It's like, ah, maybe he wants you to have a colt. <laughs> maybe that's what it is. But, but that kind of thinking, you got to be careful. Real faith is God names it and then you claim it. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, 
that let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never, he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? He has said, so that we may confidently say. He names it, and then we claim it. The prosperity gospel, it emphasizes health and wealth. Secondly, the prosperity gospel emphasizes positive confession. And thirdly, the prosperity gospel emphasizes material blessings. That is the focus, especially on the heavy-duty prosperity gospel, on that continuum that's heavy, heavy on the prosperity gospel. It's, it's all on the material things. John MacArthur said this, Word of faith teachers have corrupted the heart of New Testament Christianity. They have moved the believer's focus off sound doctrine, worship, service, sacrifice, and ministry, and they have shifted it instead to promised physical, financial, and material blessings. Those blessings are the cargo that God is supposed to deliver to those who know and follow the word of faith formula. So what is the focus? What is the emphasis? What is the goal? It's the stuff, the material stuff. And that's how you keep score, and that's how you know that God is pleased with you because you have lots of stuff. Paul said, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Paul didn't have a lot. But that's not the goal. That's not the focus. As I told you before, we have that little phrase, he who dies with the most toys wins in our world. That's what the natural man thinks. That's what prosperity theology, when it's run amok, that's what it teaches. It's all about you having a lot of stuff, a lot of wealth, because that equates to God being pleased with you. The Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, those religious leaders in Israel, the Sadducees especially, that took care of the temple, they had lots of wealth. The Bible said they were lovers of money. God wasn't pleased with them. They had lots of stuff. King Herod had lots of stuff. Was God pleased with him? Jesus called him a fox. God wasn't pleased with him. There have been lots and lots of people through history who have had lots of material things and not the blessing of God, not the hand of God, not the favor of God upon their lives. We have people in our day-to-day -day who are billionaires who couldn't care less about God. Is that the favor of God upon their lives? I think not. You know, the greatest blessings in life are not material. They're spiritual. Spiritual. And what does God promise in the Christian life? Material blessings? There are some material blessings. As I told you before when we started this series, the thing about money is everybody needs it. You can't live in this world without money. Jesus, in his ministry, he had people that supported him because ministry doesn't work if no one gives to it because you do have to pay bills. You do have to feed people. And so everybody needs it. And money is a tool that we all need but the greatest blessings are not more money, more money, more money. Howard Hughes had a lot of money. He was miserable. Toward the end of his life, he lost his mind. And if you saw pictures of Howard Hughes, his nails had grown out real long, his hair was real long. He used to be a really handsome guy, and he just was, he'd walk around in circles in his apartment or where he, wherever he lived, whatever house he was living in at the time because he owned so much stuff. Satisfaction is not in the material blessings. Satisfaction is in the spiritual blessings. And the Lord says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's the blessing is with spiritual things. Christianity is a spiritual blessing. Are there material things associated with it? Yes. Are the material the main thing? No, no. And the danger in prosperity theology is everything becomes the materials. Material, material, material. That's how you judge everything, is how much money you have. One pastor uh, was on TV, and he was bragging about the fact that his ministry, since its inception, had received over a billion dollars 
in people's gifts. And he was showcasing to his supporters his new $20 million jet that was bought with their money that they gave to him. And his $20 million jet was in a hangar with several other ministry planes that he had that would go along with his 18,000-square-foot house and other interests of his. He was very, very, and is very, very wealthy. And it's all about, see, God has blessed me. Look what I have. I'll just point to the material. Greatest blessings aren't material. They're spiritual. And the greatest temptations are material. Greatest blessings are spiritual. The greatest temptations are material. And that's why Paul, he's talking in chapter 6 here about these uh, false teachers who advocate a different doctrine. And they, they are using godliness and using the gospel to get money. Verse 5. That's also repeated in 2 Peter chapter 2, it's repeated in the, the book of Jude right before the book of the Revelation about false teachers. False teachers are focused on money, and they're focusing on you giving them money. And in their greed, the Bible says, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. God sees what they're doing. Listen, I've told you before, I'll tell you again, hell's hottest flame is for those who use the church and use the, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to bilk people so that they can build up their financial status. That's a terrible sin. Jesus said in Matthew 7, I believe he was speaking to some of these people. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, for many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is serious business. When you start messing in the things of God, you need to be careful. And we need to be uh, very reverent. Our God is a consuming fire. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. We don't know who we're dealing with so much of the time, and these guys who are so arrogant, and it's all about you giving me money, and it goes straight to me. That's serious, serious business. Greatest temptations are material. That's why it says in verse 9, those who want to get rich, you want to get rich, they fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which drown men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. There's not a sin on the planet, there's not an evil on the planet that uh, you can't find associated with the love of money. Debbie and I have been watching this television show called Person of Interest with Jim Caviezel. And uh, in that show, it's a very interesting kind of... Uh, crime type show, but people do terrible things. Why? For the love of money. It's all about money. They do the things they do because of the love of money, because the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And he says, hey, if you long for it, you'll wander away from the faith. You'll be seduced and led astray, and you'll be pierced with many pangs, literally to torture one's soul with sorrows. That is money. That's the Bible says, flee from these things, you man of God. Greatest temptations are material. You know, when it says in verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, it's the love of money, it's not money. Money is not the root of all sorts of evil. It's your attitude toward money. God is not opposed to you having a lot of money. He's opposed to you hoarding a lot of money. He's opposed to you holding a lot of money. God gives a lot of money to people, and to whom much has been given shall much also be required. And God wants to see, uh, what are you going to do with that? That's a tool. What are you going to do with the tools? Now, some of you are in here, and you don't have very many tools. You're like the guy that you say, hey, my life, God hasn't blessed me with very much money, so I, I have like in the trunk of my car, if money is a tool, I have, a, you know, in my tool chest, I have a crescent wrench and a hammer and a screwdriver. That's about all I got. That's all he's entrusted me with. But you're using the tools that he gave you. 
Some of you are in here, in here and you're a snap-on tool truck. You got lots of the wealth that God has given you. What are you doing with it? To whom much has been given shall much also be required. The guy who has the screwdriver and the hammer and the crescent wrench that uses it to the glory of God, that guy, when he dies, is going to be rewarded. And the person who's the snap-on tool truck when it comes to uh, the tool called money and hoarding it and holding it, that person is going to die. If they're a Christian, they're going to die and stand before God, and they're going to be judged for the way they didn't use the tools. And they're going to be a pauper, so to speak, in heaven because they didn't use it for his glory. I want us to take just a very brief little quiz on the love of money. Do you love money? Do you think about how to get it more than how to do a good job? Is your compensation more important than the quality of your work? Do you find yourself never having enough money, never satisfied with the money you have? Do you enjoy flaunting your money by what you wear and what you drive and what you own and where you live and where you vacation? Does it just kill you to give it away? Do you dole out your giving with an eyedropper? Well, you know, I put a dollar in the plate today. I feel pretty good about myself. Well, you're a multimillionaire. A dollar in the plate is nothing. Will you steal and lie and cheat and compromise to get money? See, if you'll sin to obtain it, Sin against God in order to get money. Lie on your expense account in order to get money. Lie on your uh, tax return in order to get a little more money. That shows that you love money more than you love God. Greatest temptations are material. And lastly, the Christian life involves suffering now with a future reward. That's what the Christian life is. You don't hear that in prosperity theology because why? That doesn't play well in Peoria. Mainstream America doesn't want to hear about suffering. But what is the true gospel? Is it health, wealth, and prosperity, or is it suffering? Yeah, suffering. Suffering. You're going to have to suffer. Paul told Timothy, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Well, I don't want to do that, Paul. Join with you in suffering? That's the Christian life. It's suffering now in order to receive a future reward. John Piper has a video out that's very popular. It's about 10 minutes long. He says this, why I abominate the prosperity gospel. He hates the prosperity gospel because he sees that it's another gospel. And John Piper says this, the problem with the prosperity gospel preachers is that they have an over-realized eschatology. They take the things that are promised in heaven and they say those things are promised to us now on earth, and they're not. They're not. Does God have uh, abundance for his children? Yes, when do we enter into that? Now? No. When we go to heaven. What eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor, nor has entered into the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love him. We think gold is so wonderful. Men lie for it, scheme for it, cheat for it, and, and it's so important to us. Gold, God paves the streets in heaven with gold. I mean, you talk about an opulent place, you talk about a beautiful place, and if you overreach and say, well, the things that are in eternity, I want them now, it doesn't work that way. Paul said this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. There is glory to be revealed. Does it pay to serve Jesus? Yes. But are there hardships? Are there trials? Are there difficulties? You bet. You bet. You talk to the Apostle Paul. Hey, Paul, what was your life like before coming to Christ in terms of material things, in terms of pleasures and things like that? Oh, man, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Gamaliel student. I was, man, I was doing great. I had lots of things, and I had respect. And then I came to Christ. Oh, well, what's it like now? Oh, I just got beaten last week, lost everything. 
was in Corinth and I didn't want to ask those people for anything because I didn't want them to think that I was taking from them. So I was bivocational and I would work all during the day and then preach in the evenings. He says in Philippians chapter 3, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, count them but dung, literally is what he said, in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There's suffering in the Christian life. And you know what? Paul suffered as a believer. And one day, they cut his head off. And he was okay with that because in the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. He was looking forward to the future. Momentary light affliction is producing for me an eternal weight of glory. Does it pay to serve Jesus even if you don't get all the stuff? Even if you don't get physical health and wealth and material blessings? It pays to serve Jesus. And it pays to believe the truth about the gospel. My friend, the Lord really does love you. He wants to do something great in and through your life. And it all starts when you surrender to him. If you're watching today and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, today is the day to make sure. You can just pray this simple prayer from your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I receive you as my King and I surrender my all to you, to follow you and obey you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real